Hello Internet, I'm here with another RPG game video. Uh, I'm going to add and show you how to add announcements to your game. Um, as always, right, this is expanding on the RPG game kind of base template. There's source code for that thing below. But if you're doing your own Blazor server project, you could follow along with a ton of this. It's all pretty relevant, this update. Uh, and even if you were doing a more traditional like REST API client server thing, you'd probably a lot of this, you know, is follow alongable. That's a term. Anyway, well, let's hop into it. Definitely, this is mainly intended for RPG game. Um, so that's what I'm going to be using here, right? This is the, the base RPG game. Uh, and I'm interested, actually, let's log out. Uh, I want to add announcements here, right? These are going to be announcements from the game developers or admins, community manager, if you got such a thing, whatever, to the player base. And you're, and you're going to want your players to see this the moment they hit the home page of your game, I assume. Also, by having it accessible logged out, Google can pick up on it. So that'll be a good thing and increase your uh, search engine, do some search engine optimization. Um, we're also going to get to talk about cross-site scripts attacks, which is really an important thing. So anyway, let's start making uh, the changes for this. As usual with these videos, it seems we're going to need a table in the database to store this new kind of content we want. Um, so let's do that. I'm going to go into database tables here using, again, Entity Framework under the hood um, to do all the database work. So uh, this looks maybe incredible. It's possible that it's catching on to things I did before. So yeah, we're the, <laughs> that's uh, GitHub Copilot kind of giving its AI out of complete suggestions. So date time offset created on makes sense. We're going to want to default this to the current date and time. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning that you should always store your dates in UTC. And then when you're worried about how to display them to people in their local time zone, that's when you do that conversion at, at display time on the front. It's a it's a display concern, not a data storage concern. So I'm going to use UTC now. That's an established best practice. Also in C sharp in particular, using date time offset instead of date time is the best practice. Uh, there there's a few more a little more exception or a little more wiggle room with that one, I would say, than the UTC now thing. But anyway, if you if you want to know more about that, it's a subject you can totally Google about. People have talked about this a lot. I'm sure even ChatGPT could answer questions about that. Um, so, yep, I won't go into it any further, uh, but we're going to set a date time, uh, uh, sorry, as a default, a default value here so that as a developer, when we're newing up announcements, we won't need to populate that. Uh, and then here is the title and body. That makes sense to me. Um, maybe you'd want to add an author. Maybe you'd want to let people thumbs up or thumbs down your <laughs> announcement. You know, you could add those, all those kinds of details, and that would change your, your schema here. But I I think for this video, this will be it. Um, let's go ahead and now register it with the database context. I always forget to do that. <laughs> so let's not forget this time. Announcements, yep. And I will put them in alphabetical order, but it's 0% important that you do so. Um, I don't know, you know, it helps when you're looking for table names to, to just scroll through. All right, so as always, we're going to need to make a migration for this, which is another entity framework thing that I've talked about many times before, and you can Google if it is strange or unfamiliar to you. So this will be, we want um, migrations add, yeah, add announcements. Yeah. This is my second take of the video. So some of these things, that was just the uh, PowerShell remembering a previous command and offering it to me. So oh, uh, does this work? Sometimes I feel like I need to stop running the thing. It's not going to go while I run. Uh, primary key to be defined. Okay, that's true. So I, I did a little mess up. So I've mentioned, so I need some sort of primary key. If you call something uh, ID, it'll know uh, whether or not that's an int or a long or a GUID. You have many options uh, for RPG game just to help you keep everything the same. Uh, I've always said, and I'm going to do it here, you should extend the RPG game table uh, base class. And this provides a long ID. In some videos, you've seen me forget, and I accidentally make everything a GUID, <laughs> which isn't going to work here. So anyway, let's put that on, and that'll fix this error. Think, think, think. Build, build, build. Build succeeded. Great. And now let's double check our migration, make sure it makes sense. It's doing the things I expect. Create an announcements table. It's got the fields I'm thinking of, and nothing else, which is also good to see. Um, for If you've done a lot of C-sharp development before with Entity Framework, you're used to 
running the migration update, doing the database update here on the command line. You don't have to do that with um, RPG game because I have thrown uh, the logic to do it here. It'll run the migrations the moment you start the application. Uh, if you do decide, I might as well mention this, I haven't talked about it much in previous videos. If you do decide to release this thing onto the internet, um, and particularly if you end up scaling out the application, this, this part, this into, into multiple servers, uh, this could be a little dangerous to have um, here in the code because what if you know you bring down a bunch of your servers and, and start multiple up at the same time and they're both now trying to run migrations? There's a potential that they could fight. It's a low risk potential, but the more you scale out, the more likely it becomes. And when it happens, it's going to be a real pain in the butt. So um, this is going to be fine for a long, long time for what you're doing, but just know there are reasons not to do it. <laughs> Uh, but those reasons really don't apply for now. Um, and I don't know, that, that kind of thing can be true of a lot of things. Uh, for example, we're also using D uh, SQLite uh, under the hood um, for our BG game, but you're definitely going to want to upgrade that before you launch. And I've talked about that in another video. Um, and there's a little comment here. So anyway, it makes development easy. So we're going to stick with all that for now. Uh, we can run the game, but we're not going to see anything. Uh, I'll get the database updated, so I'll do it. Again, I could have done that on the command line. And by the way, if you prefer to do it on the command line, it doesn't hurt to do it here. When the game runs, it just won't do the update because it'll have already been done. So anyway, uh, goal is to get announcements here. We don't see them. We have a table. For now, I'm just going to go ahead and put one in the database uh, to kind of test this out. I thought about doing um, like maybe command line tool, show you how to make a command line tool to post announcements, um, but that would I think blow out the length of the video. And I always strive to keep these under half an hour and always already fail at that. So I don't need more things working against me. Uh, so let's say hello. And then let's, there's like a, yeah, dot, dot, dot. So I'm interested, there's something else I want to do with this video and why I was talking about cross-site scripting attacks before. I don't want to support HTML here. That's a little too bananas, but I would like to support Markdown. Markdown, if you don't know Markdown, if you've done much programming, you've definitely run into it before. There are references online. Here's a markdown guide. Um, and a lot of things, uh, I would say markdown was definitely inspired by pre-existing standards from like old bulletin boards and other things. Um, and many things have since kind of drawn from markdown as, as a kind of template for their own little languages. So you've probably, you're probably familiar with a lot of the things that markdown does, but maybe not all of them, um, depending again on how much you've done markdown. So this, this page is great, markdownguide.org, and we can, it's got previews of like everything. How do you do headings? Uh, how do you do bulleted lists are gonna be somewhere? Paragraphs, um, yeah, it's interesting, right? You can, do, you can do HTML in Markdown, so there's a couple places where maybe you wanna add, um, I don't know, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. There have been cases like, I don't know, the center tag, will, <laughs> even though you probably shouldn't be using that in general, I don't know. You could put it and you could put the center tag in your HTML, but I don't think there's a way to center text um, with without HTML in Markdown. So there's a couple little things like that. Um, you can't add colors to your text really with Markdown. I don't think uh, the style tags will, will even work for that. Um, but you can do images and you can do links and you can do lists. Here's lists. You can do tables. There's all sorts of things you can do. Um, so it's a really good format. Another thing that's nice about Markdown, the reason why I'd like to support Markdown here, is it's pretty natural. You know, you're reading, you know, looking at all this stuff, you're like, okay, oh my gosh, it looks like there's a lot of things. But when it comes down to you typing stuff, um, you know, you say, here's, here's the updates. Uh, they're cool, right? So this is, I don't know, you can, it's like, that's going to be uh, italicized, fine. This is going to be a bulleted list. It's actually going to style it as a bulleted list. It's not going to just you know, look like you type the number one period space where, you know, the numbers are different widths and things. No, it's actually going to style it as a numbered list. So, uh, I don't know, update one, made things better, uh, added a cool new feature, whatever. So there are, it's easy to type as a developer or, or just a, as, a, as a human, unlike HTML maybe might be a lot to learn. I feel like uh, Markdown is pretty easy to learn. So there are advantages to using it. So I would like to support it. Is, is what I'm saying with, with this announcement system. So let's uh, look outside. By the way, I'm using Heidi SQL. I've mentioned it before, open source, free SQL database browser. Um, and when it has that red triangle there, when you make a change, so I don't know, let's remove that line. The red triangle means it hasn't saved that change yet. You have to click outside the row. 
um, interesting. Apparently that white space change wasn't enough and it thought I didn't do anything. Fascinating. Is it automatically trimming? No. Hmm. Well, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, so let's, I pressed escape, cancel the change. It seems confused. It's free. You get what you pay for. Um, all right, so we've got an announcement in the database, but it's not going to display, of course. If we go back to our game. We need to add the code to do that. And this will be pretty simple. I'm hoping this will be a pretty quick video. Uh, let's go to the home page. That's index, where we've got welcome back, et cetera, et cetera. And down below is where we want to show all of our announcements. So um, this code, by the way, it probably kind of makes sense from the tag names, but this is what a player who is logged in sees, and this is what a player who isn't logged in sees. I would like to show this to everyone. Again, we want everyone to see this before they log in. We want Google to, you know, crawl this and see interesting content on our website to give us favorable uh, SEO ranking, all that stuff. So let's make this as visible as possible. Um, this looks pretty good. This is, I bet, just guessing on um, the pet homepage. This is, it looks very similar. Let's take that suggestion and I'll modify and I can stop the game. We don't need it running right now. Um, so, if the announcements are null, we haven't even loaded them yet, we'll say loading. If we have loaded them, but there aren't any, then we'll say there's none. Otherwise, let's go ahead and list them all out. Probably I won't literally do a list. <laughs> it's an interesting guess on the part of GitHub Copilot, but we'll do something like it. Um, and let's actually, here, might as well, I do this all the time. And look, it's already selected. Haha, <laughs> must be from my previous take. Um, <laughs> let's select this code. So this is how uh, characters are loaded in your house, and it's very right? Similar needs and logic. We want a database connection. Uh, we're going to have a list of the things. And when the page is initialized, when it is, is visited uh, and is starting itself up, we'll want to load all of the things, except it won't be characters. There'll be announcements. And then we're going to do, right? This, it's all very similar process. And we've run into this with previous videos, right? I want to load up my garden. What are all the plants there? I want to load up, I can't even remember, whatever. It's, it's a very common flow. Um, so common that maybe it's worth abstracting out into, into some something else. I don't know. Uh, so let's get the database context. We won't need the current player because, again, we don't care who you are. We want to show you to everyone, whether you're logged in or logged out. Let's rename this to my announcements. And let's also we'll call this announcement. We, um, well, we're not going to just call it that. That's the name of the table entity, right? That's what we're going to fetch. We're going to fetch a bunch of announcements. Um, so we'll do my announcements equals, we'll look at the announcements table. And we don't need to have any kind of condition on the player, uh, but we do want to order these. We would like to order these by when they were published, right? So we want to show the newest stuff first. Um, and actually, let me press F5 here. Yeah, I'm surprised we weren't seeing the ID number. Um, and by the way, when you're hand adding things to the database, don't provide an ID number. The database, that's the database's job. And if you step on its toes, you can end up doing things that confuse the database. These are all reasons why you should make a real interface to add updates and not do them by hand, because you might mess something up like that by hand. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, we want to sort by this created on date. Uh, so let's do that. We will do order by, and we do want descending. We want the largest dates first. <laughs> so that would be descending. So we'll do by uh, created on, which spoilers is going to have a little issue, but we'll get to that when we get to it. And other thing I think we don't want to select all of them. So as time goes on, right, I don't know, you're going to post, if you're very successful, you might have hundreds of these things. Uh, but we're not going to want to display all hundreds of them on the home page. Adding pagination or something, I will leave up to you. I think I made another video just about pagination. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> it's getting to be too many at this point. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to say, I don't know, take the first three again, or the newest three, right? Order by date, then take the then take the first three you find, and that will be our list, and that will be our list of announcements. So this needs to be a capital. Oh, is that not, oh I called it my announcements. That's a silly name. It's just announcements. That's because it was called my characters. Um, all right, announcements equals null, then we'll say we're loading them. If it's zero, none, sure. There's a very short period of time during the lifetime of your application that you will see that message, but okay for completeness, well, we can show it. Um, but then here, I will make a div to contain this list. And that sounds like it's probably going to be a good idea for some style sheets, the announcements, and then we're going to say for each announcement in announcements. Let's wrap them up in a div again. So each announcement has its own little container. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a header. 
And, you know, maybe what we should do, interesting, we don't need that anymore, but let's, whatever. Moving on. Um, I might as well call it out. It's gray because the ID says you don't need it anymore, so let's delete it. That's all. It was in there because of the inject for the current player. Um, and so when I copy pasted that, the IDE was nice and put the using statement in for me, but we don't need it anymore. So it doesn't hurt anything, but it just bugged me to see. So I'm getting rid of it. Um, what was I saying? Ah, yes. Uh, if we're going to be nice for SEO, for example, and for screen readers, uh, your header levels should you, ideally not skip. Um, so this is the title for the whole freaking page. And then this is a subsection, one level down. So that should be an H2. And then with that, we will have several H3s for each announcement title. And if you're worried about the font size, and you're like, no, but I like the font size of H4 better or something, um, that's not what the H tags are for. The H tags are for denoting the, the these levels, right? What is it within what? If you care about styling, how it appears, that's when you use a style sheet. So never never use the tag names um, to denote appearance. That's that's what style is, is for. Um, and, and again, that helps with things like SEO and accessibility, uh, and, and even people just like to use the keyboard to navigate around your site and, and things like that, or, or even sometimes mouse interactions. So use the tags as they're intended. Um, this abusing the header, you know, the H levels is, is a very minor offense. It's not going to affect that much, but, you know, I don't know. Let's play nice with Google. <laughs> We're all Google's play things, uh, so whatever. Um, anyway, let's make this the announcement title. I would also like to show the announcement date. Um, so we'll do the created on, and let's turn that. So I, I'm just I'm just gonna skip. I know that if I just say barf the date onto the page, it's gonna look like nonsense. It's gonna be like blah 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 numbers. Gonna include a time zone offset. It's gonna have brackets in it and stuff. It looks like a mess. It's not very human readable. So we should use to string. And if your IDE is very nice to you when you um, call to string, it'll do this. This is a feature they actually added this in a. There's like language support for this, and the uh, .NET developers uh, added extra information to to string for dates that allows the IDE to display this kind of information. So I think a lot of IDEs should should support this, um, and there's ways you can do that yourself for your own functions if you're interested to to expand what the IDE does. Actually, I don't remember what it is, but I wonder if we jumped to declaration, string syntax. So it's this stuff. You can do a string syntax thing. I forget all how it works, but Google string syntax, string syntax attribute, and you should be able to find more information. I haven't hooked up a function myself to do it. I probably should do it more because, um, I don't know, it's, it's interesting, it's neat. So anyway, I think I saw D there looked good. Uh, big D apparently gives us a nice uh, string format that, I don't know, looks decent. I mean, there's others in here. And of course, you can always do the traditional, you know, you can customize it if you want it full control over hours, minutes, and seconds, or whatever it is. I forget. Um, but I'll just use this built-in format. That looks good enough for me. But of course, feel free to customize and make it look good to you. And then down here, I want to show the announcement body. Let's just put it out as it is without markdown. Um, and see what it looks like, right? Well, I mean, this is just going to take the text, flat it on the page as HTML, where our new lines mean nothing. So it's not going to look good. Right, okay, so this is the, also the issue I was alluding to. SQLite, apparently, I didn't know this before I tried doing this video, again, on my first take. SQLite does not support ordering on date time, on date time offset, specifically. I think it will work for date time. I would say when... I don't know. This is an interesting thing. So we're using SQLite for development. The reason I've chosen to use SQLite is it's really easy to get started. You don't have to install a database. If you wanted to use Postgres or SQL, you, know, you can get SQL Express. That's their free tier. I'm pretty sure it's free, depending on, on it's got some limits. But but anyway, you would have that's a whole other piece of software you'd have to install. It's a big download. Um, it's kind of difficult to install Postgres on Windows. You have to be careful with some of the options. So I just didn't want to make people have to do that to get started with RPG games. So I said, all right, we're going to use SQLite. It keeps this database, database by just throwing a file on your hard drive right here. This is the database file. I'm not going to double click it here. It will look like garbage, but uh, you know, we can open it with a proper client that knows how to handle that, that garbage <laughs> and turn it into something meaningful. Um, so SQLite has a lot of pros for that reason, um, but you definitely shouldn't release with it. It's not very performant. And also, it can't even order on date time offsets. What's up with that? So. In the meanwhile, 
So I, I, so here's two things you can do. You could say, okay, that limitation of SQLite in mind, I'm going to use date time because I think it will sort on date time. I haven't tested that. But then you're kind of going against the best practices in, in C Sharp for, for what structures to use for keeping dates. So I think what I, what I want to do, but this isn't, I don't know, we're making a trade off here. Rather than sort by the date that was created, we'll sort by the ID. So we're exploiting the fact that IDs are incremented one, one at a time, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But I don't know, like that's kind of an accident, right? That's this code here doesn't signal to someone looking, what are you doing? Why ID? IDs could get out of order. I don't know, maybe you come in here and you do mess with them. Now it's a three, and now when two is made, it's going to have a later date, and then they're going to come in the wrong order, um, right? ID does not necessarily mean timestamp. What we want to do is sort by timestamp. That's more readable. That's what we intend. That's semantic, right? It's, it's what we it's what we intend, and so that's what we should we should ask. Um, but because of the SQLite limitation, it can't be done. Hmm, what do you want to do about that? Maybe you've already upgraded to Postgres. Then great, you can just keep sorting on date time. If you haven't. Maybe sort by ID for now until later. Will you remember? I think that's the biggest downside. I would be afraid for me. I can't remember anything. Um, that by the time I update to Postgres, I'm never going to remember to come and find all these order by descendings. Maybe you've got some sort of checklist of work to do. Add this to your checklist, whatever. So anyway, it's an unfortunate limitation of SQLite. I wasn't aware of it until I was doing this, um, but there it is. So we'll work around it. We'll do it by ID instead. And here it doesn't look great. So <laughs> this is what I was talking about, right? We just put some text on the page. And I don't know if, if you haven't done a whole lot of, of HTML or something, maybe that seems kind of strange to you. But you know, it's like all the all these enters and spaces here, right? These don't mean anything when we come out here. That's all ignored by HTML. We can we can say hi, hello, uh, what? Like none of this none of this white space matters. It's funny how it got rid of that. Um, it's just gonna it's, it's equivalent to this, <laughs> but with spaces. So anyway, we want to turn this markdown into HTML. And there are libraries that will help us do that. And there are big old caveats to uh, and, and dangers to be aware of. And that's the cross site scripting stuff that I was talking about and will totally demonstrate. So let's stop running this for now. And let's install a couple NuGet packages that will help us out. So there's a great one called markdig. I have previously searched for it. So here it is, markdig. This um, 4.net turns it's got a function let's look at the home page it has a function oh it's opening in the wrong browser well that's okay you can open there if it wants Oop. load 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 i didn't even have firefox open so now it's like starting it all up you can do it i believe in you all right let's scroll down so this uh turns markdown into html that's what we want super useful and here there's talking about all the fun things built in extensions, apparently. So it does a few extra things that normal um, markdown doesn't do, apparently some mathematic expressions, all kinds of fun stuff. But what we, we really want is this markdown to HTML. So you give it some markdown, and it spits out some HTML. I'm going to do just that. And we're going to see when it becomes dangerous. So I'm just going to move this off screen. <laughs> So we can just put that right here. Oh, once I've installed markdig, I'll install markdig. And this isn't markdig's fault. This isn't like a weakness in the markdig implementation or anything. Like this is just a thing to be aware of when we get there. So the first thing we're going to try is just say markdown to HTML. And spoilers, this isn't going to work for different reasons. And I'll show you. So let's rerun. Project. Boop, boop, boop. All right, so it gave us HTML, but what the heck? Why are we seeing the HTML instead of it being rendered as HTML? And the reason is that Blazor is aware of cross-site scripting attacks, and lots of front-end frameworks are. I know Angular for sure does a similar thing. I have much less experience with React, I'm not sure. Um, but the reason that they're doing this, and here's the, the easiest explanation. What if you made forums where people could type whatever text that they wanted, and they started typing HTML that broke your layout. What if they just typed slash div slash body slash whatever, you know, and started typing their own HTML, and then they're going to screw up the page for everyone who looks at the page, right? That is the least of your concerns, however, because the other thing someone might do is type script and start typing JavaScript. And um, 
I'll get to why that's bad. I'll show you why that's bad uh, next. But let's for now just solve this issue. Let's say we don't know about cross-site scripting attacks yet. And we're just like, man, how come I can't show this HTML on the page? There is a way to do it. I forget oftentimes, so it's helpful that this is my second take. Uh, nope, it's called like, oh, I think it is like markup string. Yeah, markup string. So markup string, if you cast some string to this class, it has built-in stuff to make it easier, whatever. It, it probably looks weird syntactically, and if you're not interested in the C sharp, don't worry about it too much. But you can take some text here. This could have been anything. It could have been, you know, uh, strong, high, strong, right? This would also work. And we'll let you output that as, like, that will actually come through as HTML. I mean, obviously, that's silly to do because I can come out here and do it. But if this was a string, yeah, right, maybe I set it down here. Maybe I make a string and I want the string to come out properly, then, then this is how I would do it. So anyway, we're going to do it to this markdown. And now it's going to work. But then I'm going to show you why something bad can happen and what we need to do to prevent the bad. <laughs> so now it works. And you might think your job here is done. We've got announcements. It says hello. If we had multiple of them, they would be listed down. There's some styling we could do here, and maybe I'll spend a little time. How long is this video? We're at 26 minutes? Maybe I won't, um, because we need to talk about process scripting attacks. So you're not going to do this to yourself as a developer, but let's go ahead and type a little bit of, um, we'll do like alert. Hi. All right, we're going to put some HTML. We're going to put some JavaScript <laughs> into our HTML. Now we're going to refresh this. And now it says hi. So if you had a form system, again, or a mail messaging system, people can send each other messages, and you're like, I want to support Markdown. OK, we're going to turn that Markdown into HTML. You are letting people, <coughs> oh, excuse me, um, you are accidentally letting people uh, send each other JavaScript code to execute. You could ask every viewer of this you know, content, however you sent it to people, to do some Bitcoin mining for you. You could ask it to steal their session from the, um, uh, we're not using cookies in RPG game, I don't think, but it doesn't matter. It's local storage or cookies or whatever. You can get all of it with JavaScript. So someone could, and that's called a session hijack. They can take your session ID and then log in as you. You do not want to let people put script tags and pass those around to people. You're going to have a very bad time. It's a very bad exploit to have. Um, so this little thing here, markup string, is dangerous. The moment you use markup string, you should start asking yourself a lot of questions about where is this data coming from? Is it actually going to be safe? Who, who can put it in? And maybe for you, you say, I don't know, it's the announcements. No one else is going to be writing those except me. Maybe I even want to put script tags in to count views. Or I don't know. You probably shouldn't do that. I would say don't. Don't anyway. Um, what if there's, what if someone gets access to your account? What if, you know, if you make the ability to post announcements inside the page, inside the website, and someone gets access to your account and can post announcements, you know what? Yes, on its own, perhaps there wouldn't be an issue, but do you really want where one other issue somewhere else now makes this a big issue, you know? So, so let's try to mitigate the places where our, our surface of attack for a website. So let's not allow script tags. In here, so let, let me put that back, and we're gonna, this way we'll be able to confirm: did we properly take it out? This shouldn't be allowed. So there is, and I don't remember the name of it, even though I did it already. There's an HTML sanitizer for C sharp. I found it already once before. Maybe a, oh no, is this it? I think this is it. Yes, this is the one with all this crazy this list of, of properties allowed and things. All right, so this is a sanitizer that will take out all of your it's looking out for xss <laughs> clean out html anything that might look dangerous so there's a list of allowed tags a list of allowed css um for markdown you already can't do most css so that's not an issue and i think there are technically some weird things you can do with with um css to like get some information on people but um i forget something about, like how when links are colored based on visiting. There was something like that. I think browsers patched up those issues years ago. Anyway, we want this. We want this bit of code here. We want to get an HTML sanitizer. I'm going to ask it to sanitize our HTML. And we'll do that before making the markup string. So it's going to go right after we turn it into HTML, but before we tell uh, Blazor, hey, this is safe. So there's a couple ways we can do this. I'm going to do it this way. Um, 
we're on the assumption that we're going to be doing this a lot throughout the website, we might want access to this HTML sanitizer many times. So I'm going to register it as a service because then we'll have access to it. You can see there's like this current player service that's built into RPG game that, that I made. Um, you can make your own services too and, and, and make them available anywhere, or you can just take any old class and register the service. Um, one thing that I felt like I used to like to do before .NET made the, made the random class better was make a new random and pass that around throughout my code and have that one single instance of random because there were um, problems if you were just newing them up all the time. So it was, it was a better thing to do. But C Sharp, they've sold that by now. You use random.shared and you're all good. But <laughs> let's, um, for us, we're going to want a new HTML sanitizer. Oh, I haven't installed this thing. What am I doing? I have to install this NuGet package. So manage NuGet, HTML sanitizer. Yep, that's it. But it can be used for cross-site scripting. Yeah, that's what we want. Well, that's interesting. They say it can be used for cross. We want it to prevent cross-site scripting, actually. So here's what you can do. If there's any particular um, object that you would like just one of in the whole application of your, of your code, you can register it as a singleton like this. There are other ways to do it. You could do HTML sanitizer. This would work too. That, that maybe is a little more, uh, that's how we do current play. That's, that's, let's do that in syntax. Either syntax will work. Um, if you needed um, constructor parameters, like suppose HTML sanitizer, I think it does, um, you can pass it in options. Then you would use the other syntax because then you can pass in those options. You can't pass in any options like this. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, let's do it this way. Now, throughout our whole application, we can just ask for an HTML sanitizer. So we'll go back to, not announcements, but to index. And we will ask for services the way we always do with inject. So we'll say, hey, give me an HTML sanitizer. I need the IDE to get that for me. That's control dot or alt enter again, depending on your IDE to get it to, um, which was just adding that. It's just, hey, I noticed you're missing a little bit of code to use this. I did it. I think I've talked about this in previous videos. Um, so now that we have the HTML sanitizer, we can use it. We will say here, sanitize. And maybe it's a little weird that I use the exact same name. I mean, you could call this, you know, just sanitizer. I don't know, just to demonstrate that it's not, you're not using the class name here. You're using the name of this variable. It just happened that I named the variable the same thing as the class name, which can be a little confusing. So eh, maybe you want to avoid it. I don't know. I'll just leave it as HTML sanitizer. I think it's fine. It happens enough. And we've got colors to let us know that we're doing the right thing. So if you're comfortable with the, the different colors, um, right here, for example, we're using the class name rather than an instance of the class. So anyway, let's see that this has worked and that we no longer have horrible, terrible cross-site scripting vulnerability in our website. Just close these other copies. And there you go. Let's, let's confirm, right? So I'm not getting that alert high. Uh, it is still in the database, right? This on the database. So we have successfully um, taken out that. But hopefully, let's try some other things. Hopefully, we haven't taken out tags that we do like, like strong. What if we wanted to use um, bold instead? Um, have we lost that ability? We have not. So it, again, has this white list. What are the allowed or allow list of um, HTML tags that are allowed? And then everything else isn't, <laughs> which is, in general, for security, that's the you would r rather than make a list of things forbidden, it is better to say, here's a list of things I trust because you don't know what's going to come out. Maybe a new tag comes out. Maybe script two comes out and browsers start supporting it. And, but all you did was forbid script. So it is better to, to say, here are the list of things I do accept that'll protect you better. And that is what that library is doing, the HTML sanitizer library is doing. So there you go. You can now add announcements to your game. You can support markdown in content in your game and you'll be safe from cross-site scripting attacks. Please, please, please always be aware when you're using markup string that you have that potential <laughs> of introducing uh, that vulnerability. So um, libraries like this, HTML sanitizer, really good. Um, there are equivalents in other languages as well, of course. Uh, but that's not what this video is about. This video is about C Sharp. So anyway, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. If you are interested in adding other things to your game, I've got links to the playlist in the description. Uh, if you've got questions, about, I don't know, anything in this video. Maybe I missed something. Did I miss some other security best practice? Oh my goodness, please let me and everyone else know by posting in the comments. Um, and if there are other things you would like me to make, you know, other, other things you'd like to see me cover, other additions to make to a, a browser-based game, uh, particularly a Blazor server one, feel free to ask. I'm, I'm happy for any such ideas. Uh, thank you very much for watching and goodbye.